and welcome to Look Down There, the show where we talk about all the things we don't talk about. I'm your host, Michelle Amore. Today, my guest is one of the founders of NISA, a company that is dedicated to raising awareness of our unmentionables, mainly our puberty, postmenopause, and the fourth trimester. They are also the creators and innovators of the self-care mirror V-Vision, which is the perfect mirror for looking down there. Please welcome my guest today, Aubrey Howard. Hi, Hi. Aubrey. Hi. So wonderful to see you. Um, a friend of mine, you know, because she knows I, I do this project and this podcast, and I'm very passionate about um, encouraging people to look down there and decreasing the shame that we have surrounding our vulvas. And she sent me the photo of your mirror and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I have to talk to this person. I saw the name of your podcast. We were sending it around. We were like, look at this. Look down there. What an amazing name. So it seems like a perfect match. <laughs> Yes, I, I love it. So I definitely want to talk about the mirror, but before we get into that, I want to talk about NISA and when and why you created it. Yeah, that is is a great question. And I think it's kind of rooted in, in a couple different things. Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm, I identify as a woman and as a woman with a, a vulva and a female body, I... Um, I have found that my entire life, despite growing up in an incredibly matriarchal family, um, we were a large family, almost of exclusively women and a women supported family. Um, there were kind of consistently these times and experiences where um, the female body or the female experience and just the, the natural biological realities of, of having a female body um, were either not talked about or there were, you know, these hacks, these like special things that were passed down um, to help you deal with a specific um, issues that are specific to a the way a female body functions. Um, and so I say that because I've definitely had a few sort of framework shattering moments in my life. You know, I was an avid reader growing up and I know um, the first time when I went in, into university and took a, a feminist literature class, learned about feminist critical theory, it's like, whoa, mind blown. All of these books that I've read, you know, I've, I've, they're all sort of written in this default male voice and, and I feel completely enlightened. Um, and so again, that moment came after childbirth. Um, and I think, you know, we're kind of messaged a lot of things about what pregnancy is supposed to look like and what childbirth is supposed to look like. And, um, that entire experience, particularly the postpartum experience, um, not only conversationally, but also through design, um, I felt so completely just forgotten and discluded. I was like, oh, I'm having all of these issues. Is there, can I, you know, get on the internet and, and find a product to deal with this? Um, is there anybody talking about these issues? Um, and I was very uh, fortunate to have gone through that experience with two very close friends. We all had babies in, in the same year, on uh, the same six months really from each other. And we all went through it together. And we just kind of had this consistent like, what the hell um, it, collective experience. And we were able to talk about it together and really think about solutions for those issues. But um, I think despite the fact that it was is rooted in that time period and the vulnerability that we felt and really just like the lack of support from all sides, um, it really kind of made us reconsider those other moments in our lives, whether it was around menstruation um, first sexual experiences, first, you know, like masturbating, really understanding the female genitalia. I mean, I remember having the experience of like, oh, there are multiple, I have multiple holes. There's like one for pee and what is this other thing for? Um, and so we really, you know, we, we design products and that's particularly important to us, but perhaps more important is just making things more visual, more public, 
having conversations about looking at your vulva, having conversations about, uh, you know, mood disorders after birth, all of these different things that, um, that I think the lack of conversation and the lack of functional products or services um, surrounding them just really leads to a feeling of isolation, of, um, of a loss of agency. Yeah, I, you know, talking about the unmentionables or, or all the things that we don't talk about, like once we start to give voice to those things, suddenly we feel empowered. And I feel like education is so important to our empowerment. And also, like you were saying, to not feel so isolated. And suddenly when you talk about it, you say, oh my gosh, you you feel this way too? And, and then suddenly you have this great support network around you and you that's empowering and you have that agency and autonomy and it's very exciting yeah absolutely and i also think that even if even if you're dealing with something um that you're not seeing maybe expressly talked about seeing other similar similar issues being expressly talked about gives you gives you permission right to you know the whole phrase unmentionables is kind of rooted in the idea that it's something we're not supposed to talk about. So if we open it up to like, no, we are we are supposed to talk about these things, supposed to find community and, um, and just contextualization within those conversations, um, it opens up the possibility of, of speaking about something else. Yeah, and why the name Nisa? I was trying to find the, like, how you got there. Well, that's a great question. We were called quite a few things. Um, you know, I think that the name Nisa, well, to take it a few steps back, we came up with the concept of Nisa, I think a whole year or two before we actually launched a product. Um, so we, we really wanted everything to be rooted in these conversations and in the community and in the network for a few different reasons. Um, the conversation piece that I just spoke about and, and its importance to all three of us, um, the three founders, but also because um, if you know much about the gender data gap and the amount of design that is done um, specifically for, for women or for non you know, male folks, um, this is really done without any without any data, right? Without any understanding, without any learnings of, of the needs and, and the shapes and how those should be designed. Um, leads to a lot of really unfortunate consequences, uh, whether they're intentional or not. So we wanted to sort of start these conversations, um, start the community and the networking so that we could really widen our, our data set for the design process. Um, and in that time, we had the opportunity to throw around a whole lot of names and uh, trying to be kind of business oriented as well. You know, there are other things that, that we needed to keep in mind um, regarding how it's going to exist on the internet and how people are going to find us and all that. So after probably going through about hundreds of suggestions, um, our chief creative officer came up with NISA, which means uh, new beginnings in Greek and, and woman in Arabic. And the sound of it and, and what it meant and, and all of that just really solidified, you know, that was it. That was our name. So uh, I am very pleased that you pronounce it correctly because we, we get a lot of Nissa <laughs> I'm in night. Uh, you know what? I, I me actually meant to ask you before we started recording and I just went with it. So I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So as I was looking on your site yesterday, you, you have a lot of products that are geared towards uh, the fourth trimester. And I am not a mother personally, and I actually wasn't aware of that term or that phase in the pregnancy, the fourth trimester. And I think really the only thing that we really get to talk about or hear about, and it is getting a lot more attention these days is the postpartum depression, but we're not really hearing about maybe some of the other physical aspects that are going on in the fourth trimester. Can you talk more about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think one of the beautiful things about the term fourth trimester um, is the fact that when you talk about postpartum, when you, when you sort of use the term postpartum, obviously it's a medical term, it's, you know, after after birth, but it doesn't really lend itself to sort of envisioning that recovery period as a part of the birthing process. 
And, um, you know, this it's so cool how much this conversation has really changed in the last five years. Um, it's been really sort of heartening and, and exciting to see that. Um, but I know that five years ago, um, you know, there I think it's sort of the dominant narrative was this idea of, you know, you go through pregnancy and everybody, you know, sort of loves the pregnancy, even if you have really difficult experiences physiologically or emotionally. Um, people are really kind to you, like opening doors and, and all of that and understand that um, your body needs rest and you need to take care of yourself because you have a baby in you. Um, and then you have the baby. And I, I think sort of the societal expectation and, and the visual messaging and what we see in TV shows and movies was always sort of like, and then you bounce back. And then your concern needs to be you know, about if you did you gain too much weight, you need to focus on losing weight. How do you get your muscle tone back? Um, and that's just not the reality of the physical recovery process. And I mean, everybody's bodies are different. There are certainly people out there who give birth and really do just feel great afterwards. But I think the um, overarching reality for most people who give birth is that there are at least um, a few months after that where your body is, is really torn apart and obviously you know you, whether you give birth via cesarean or whether you give birth vaginally um it's via cesarean that's a major abdominal surgery i gave birth via emergency cesarean and um couldn't lift things like truly my partner had to pull me out of bed to feed the baby in the middle of the night i um, mean i still had postpartum bleeding i mean you're you're bleeding <laughs> it's a uh, and it lasts for you know sometimes up to 12 weeks um and then there's the the huge hormonal shifts that happens afterwards um i know for me personally i kind of had um, an opposite experience but a lot of folks uh have which is my hormone levels normalized sort of like dramatically normalized post-birth and my uh my sort of months leading up to birth, they had a lot of uh, hormonal spikes and, and it made me feel very mentally and emotionally unstable. Um, but anyway, to sort of get back to the point of, of what recovery looks like and, and why this term, the fourth trimester, I think is is really important and really useful is just that um, that narrative isn't true, that you're going to bounce back, that you need to focus on, um, you know, getting your shape back or getting your figure back you need to heal whatever that healing looks like for you you know and that's hard for a lot of reasons a lot of people have to go back to work um and and that's incredibly difficult uh, the emotional fallout can be incredibly difficult and one of the things we wanted to do with nisa is yes address the physiological changes and the physiological recovery that needs to happen but we also it was so incredibly important for us to and that's my dog, uh, to continue to maintain the focus on the, the birthing parent, not on the baby, right? Again, the maternity period is great. Everybody wants you to take care of yourself because of the baby. Um, you should be equally as cared for when you're recovering from birth and it's healthier for the baby. You know, it's healthier for everyone. That's not why you should do it, but it just is all around um, an important thing to do. So we really want to continue to push that um, aesthetically in our language, you know, we're, we're not talking about the, the first month of baby's life. We're talking about the first month of your life as a new parent with a child. Yeah. I think that's a really unique thing because you don't see that very much, you know, and as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking about celebrities who have babies and they come back and they come out and it's just like a rubber band. They just go right back to their acceptable uh, size. And I, I, I'm thinking about Kate Middleton right now where there was that big ordeal where she left the hospital. What was it just a few days after? Like just perfectly quaffed and amazing with the baby and, you know. Right, um, which was like bold, bold move wearing white. Right, yeah, <laughs> right. So, I mean, there was, she got so much backlash um, surrounding that, but I mean, she's not the only one that kind of pro propels this idea that it's just like, oh, you just pop a baby out and then you just go back to work, you know, like, and if, and I, I imagine that there's guilt to that if you can't immediately just snap back and go back into your regular life. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think the one of the positive things is that, you know, I think that it's problematic when sort of celebrity culture doesn't in some ways like mirror speak to the, the general culture, right? If the expectation through um, that, you know, messaging over news and, and tabloids and whatever is that like everybody bounces back, you know, um, Kate Middleton is more than welcome to do like what she needs to do in her life to feel good. If dressing up and taking those photos makes you feel good, but all means you should do that um but thankfully like chrissy teigen and serena williams and some of these other um amy schumer who's you know just absolutely hilarious are, are sharing you know feel like they can share also their real experiences of not bouncing back of of tearing of you know um, emotional uh sort of the emotional transformation and sometimes distress that happens during that time um again I, I always kind of bring it back to me because i don't know my experience my experience is just mine but um if i've had it it probably means that some other folks have too um the transition into becoming a parent is so like identity shattering it's hard it's really hard uh and and i think that that's sort of an important piece that folks should realize as a possibility after giving birth. Again, it's not just physiological and it's not just postpartum depression either. You know, there's a range of um, perinatal, I think they're called perinatal mood and anxiety disorders um, that are related to a bunch of, of different um, physiological changes, but also, you know, in my opinion, I, I think that our societally new parents and parents in general, and a lot of people, uh, frankly, just aren't really given support that they need. So we kind of pathologize like, oh, you're anxious and oh, you're you're this like that's the problem with you. And, and really, it's kind of a structural and societal problem. Anyway, um, there's a whole wide range of things that someone can experience emotionally. Um, I did also have um, postpartum anxiety, you know, which was difficult. But once I knew what it was like that. Nah, I know this is a thing I can. I, I took some SSRIs for three months and my, I got reset, learned some meditation techniques and was fine. You know? Yeah. And there, like, there's that education piece. It's like, as soon as you know, oh, this is what's happening. And suddenly you have the tools that you can seek out and find solutions and help you along. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about maternity leave as you're talking here, because the fourth trimester doesn't really seem like it would have uh, an end date, right? Like it's it's pretty nebulous in, in how long it can last for, for people. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, how long is the average maternity leave? Um, well, um, the United States is one of the only um, developed nations that does not have a federally mandated maternity leave policy for employers. Um, so really, though someone technically cannot lose their job over sort of a, you know, a birth or, or pregnancy, um, in terms of, of like what's usual, um, there's a lot of unpaid maternity leaves, leave that happens. I, mean, I think in the United States, the majority of people who give birth go back to work two weeks after um after birth and again this is assuming no complications uh you know complications if your kid is in the NICU if you know there's there's a lot of things that can happen is that's already hard enough um and then i think sort of in a white collar corporate setting generally two months uh if, if it's a generous policy sometimes three months is pretty standard but again, it's it's there's no there's no mandate, uh, so anything can happen. And you know, I encourage people to do this because I my pregnancy was not planned. Um, you know, I I was I wanted to have a baby at some point in my life, but my pregnant my pregnancy wasn't planned. And I found out that my you know the company that I was working for did not I didn't have paid leave and all those sorts of things. So if you're accepting a job and you think that at some point you want to have a baby check it out just so you know and you can uh prepare and, you know i have a, my best friend um it's like i'm not having kids i'm like that's you know it's great what's what's up she's like i am i'm not rich enough i'm not you know i know that emotionally 
I cannot handle the instability that will come with having a child at like my socioeconomic status. I mean, I just don't live in a place that supports that. She's an anthropologist. She made that decision long before I had really any knowledge about it. And I, I talk to her all the time now. And I'm just like, oh, I get it. <laughs> I get it, right? <laughs> oh, how, how old is your child right now? He's four. How were your pandemic times? Were you, did you have good bonding moments or were you going a little stir crazy? You know, so we're, we're really, really, really lucky. Um, you know, I've been able to work remotely. Um, my partner and I decided bef- long before the pandemic uh, that it was really important to us as a, as a partnership for one of us to stay home with our son um, and to kind of foster his, you know, his first few years in the world. Um, so honestly, it's, it's, there were lots of struggles, I think, and in uncertainty and instability. Um, but for the most part, it's been great. I get to be with my family and, um, and really have the, you know, to have the opportunity to like spend the extra hours that you might be commuting with your kid is huge for me Mm -hmm. I know I know not for everybody and I know I mean I don't know how either single parents who have to work and and have kids at home or parents who both work or you know any really sort of configuration you could come up with for that like there's it's been really difficult for a lot of people and for a lot of parents and one of the things that I'm continually thinking about um again from my very lucky position of um not having to make a decision right now about going back to work or about having to send my child to school. But with the vaccinations that are happening and with the sort of increase in overall public health and safety, um, all of those families with kids who can't get vaccinated and how hard that's going to be for a lot of people, how a lot of people are going to have to make difficult decisions and and how they might get left behind um, in some of that. Yeah. I want to go back to the maternity leave. Um, I am shocked that there isn't a federal mandate for that. And um, that just that the value of creating life is is not valued. Um, that's that's a surprise to me. I mean, I, I expected you to say, oh, yeah, it's about six weeks. You know, um, two weeks is totally unacceptable. Three months seems, you know, maybe luxurious, but also maybe not enough time. What do you think is the answer? And what do you think is the ideal? Like if you could, if you could affect this change and and maybe you're working to affect this change, but if you could do that, what would it be that you would ask for? Yeah. I mean, that is really a fantastic question. Um, And I think there are kind of multiple layers and I kind of want to set the stage by also saying that um, there was some research, I, I know I mentioned this kind of at the beginning, but women, female bodies, female pr- perspectives are pretty systematically discluded from research, um, specifically when it, become, when it comes to healthcare and medical research, which is fascinating. We're often discluded because um, our hormonal me- regulations can make it more difficult to get sort of an accurate data set for scientists. But also that means then like we're just not included in, in a medical trial or prescription drug trial, or all those different sorts of things, which is completely maddening. I need uh, to but- say, I need to say, you know, we're we're landing machines, robots on Mars, like, and we can't figure out the female body. Like, come on. Like we can figure out some shit. <laughs> like, let's do this. this. Can I blow your mind for just a second? I don't know how old you are. Um, do you know when the first scientific, like biological, physiological mapping was done of the clitoris? I think it was it was pretty recently, right? Nineteen ninety. Yeah. Like no. Yeah, because weren't they just using uh, like animal parts before, right? Well. Uh, you know, we do. That'll be a whole different conversation. Yeah, right. But no, I know that's just nuts. Yeah. But to get back to the to the whole uh, mandated federal maternity leave thing, um, you know, I think that sometimes when we deal with these issues, it's really important for us to take a few steps back. 
Um, and I, I mentioned the research because there was research done about recovery from the postpartum period. You know, we hear a lot this idea of, of six weeks um, because six weeks is generally the time that unless you've had complications, a, a gynecologist will tell you that you can have sex again. You, that's your, your postpartum, you go to the pediatrician, I think a day or two after you return home uh, from the hospital, or if you are at home, you know, that's, that's when you would go to see a pediatrician. And then the, the parent is, has a wellness checkup scheduled six weeks after. So it's kind of this really arbitrary time that you, know, you go, they check you out, um, they're like, everything looks fine, uh, you can have sex now. And, and for the majority of people, I think that's that's how it goes. Um, but this research that was done looked at the full physiological um, recovery process for someone who's just given birth. And their conclusion is that it actually takes about six months to a year for both the physical and the, the physical process can take that long, um, but the emotional recovery process as well. Um, and sort of just getting to to a stable place, um, but as it as it pertains to anything that's federally mandated or protected, um, I think I always have to take a few steps back and look at these really diametrically opposed ideas that I think we tend to have um, in in this country at least. Uh, one of which is that children young children, small children are deserving of care and, and loving attention and all of those sorts of things. Um, and also sort of that both both parents are generally re required to work if there are two parents within a family um, system. And that expectation of returning to work that quickly after birth really doesn't support sort of the other expectation of new parents, which is to like really be there for their kids and provide that care and provide a loving home and, you know, all of those different sorts of things. Um, in terms of advocating for a federally mandated maternity leave, it's something, uh, you know, we're, we're working on our own projects all the time. Um, the maternal mortality rate is something that we've really been focusing on for the last couple of years because it's ridiculously high and in this country ridiculously high for um, women of color. But I would say um, there needs to be something where a woman's job is protected and pay is provided to show the value that we place on, um, you know, if we're a family of, of creating life and all of those sorts of things. And there also needs to be other structures in place that do make returning to work easier. Um, affordable childcare is a huge thing. I mean, one of the reasons my partner and I decided to kind of operate this way is because it's just as expensive for us to have childcare as to have him stay home, you know? Uh, so there are quite a few surrounding structures uh, that are just as important as the federally mandated maternity leave. But if we could start anywhere, like let's start at six weeks, that would change the lives of so many people giving birth in this country. Yes, a paid six weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Job security. Yeah. Um, but I wanna go to the mirror now because it is genius. <laughs> I love it. I ordered one yesterday, so I'm very much looking forward to using it. And it's my favorite color, so thank you for that. <laughs> so tell me about V Vision. Yes. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning that that sort of this postpartum period uh, was really the impetus to um, start this business, but from the very beginning, that was not where we wanted to stay. Obviously, if we had like unlimited time and resources, we we had a lot of ideas. Um, but the mirror. Um, was sketched on the back of a napkin. One of the beautiful things about having a company designed to meet women's already unmet needs or, or sort of un unmentionable needs is that there's a lot of stuff to do and a lot of ideas uh, that we have. Um, and I think the reason that we kind of decided to move forward with this one specifically is because it's just 
so important to us um, to demystify the vulva and the female anatomy. Um, I think there are so many out there who are unaware of the difference between the terms vulva and vagina. And, you know, you mentioned the education piece earlier. Um, you know, a lot of people have um, sexual education or, or whatever they call it in school these days. Um, and primarily, it focuses on the reproductive health of a female uh, anatomy, which is the ovaries and, and uterus and all of those things. And we don't learn about our sexual health and our sexual wellness. And um, the three founders, so the other two founders are Mia and Eden, um, the three of us kind of all bring really different perspectives um, that align in great ways. And when Eden brought this to the table on the back of the napkin, she was just like, we, we got to have something, you know, to make it visible and something that's beautiful and elegant and really celebrates the visual aspects of the vulva and celebrates um, the knowledge of your own physical anatomy. Um, and it's not something that you want to like hide away in a drawer or something like that. Like that's, that's what I want to do. And, and we all hopped on that. So um, the mirror is designed to be hands-free um, so that you can explore and so that you can sort of pull room or insert menstrual cup or, or anything like that that you need to do. And it's also illuminated to give you as, as sort of clear of a view as you can get. Um, but I have like three that I'm looking at right now. And <laughs> I just love to have around. My son has been using them. He's like putting them there, like checking it out. It's like, oh, that's what that looks like. Uh, but we, you know, we've been taught to, to place a lot of shame and a lot of weird external aesthetic pressure on our vulvas, you know, that they look a certain way or that they smell a certain way, um, without really focusing on what our own individual vulva actually looks like. And I think on top of the agency and the knowledge and the understanding of that, you know, that a part of your body, um, it can be incredibly important from a health perspective too. Um, one of the things that I did when I was pregnant and I found really fascinating because you do have all of these very intense hormonal fluctuations. If you look, um, and I was using, you know, a hand mirror, you really get to see it's, it's cool. You know, it's like you get to see what's happening in your body based on the changes in your vulva. And I know that's true of a lot of uh, perimenopausal women and menopausal women too, you can really kind of check and see what's happening um, with, you know, your your hormones and pH and blood flow and all of those different things by looking at your vulva. Um, and then I also had a very specific experience, a health experience that I often think back to when I had the mirror uh, or, uh, and wishing that I would have had the mirror. I was in my 20s and um, thought that I had an ingrown hair, like an infected ingrown hair, like, you know, some folks get. Um, and it continued to get more and more painful. And I ended up going to a clinic, a women's health clinic, because I didn't have insurance. It's kind of a terrifying story. And a woman came and, you know, lifted up my gown and just like, oh my gosh, you have to go, you have to go to the ER now. I was like, oh. It's like the most terrifying thing you could ever hear in that, in that setting. Uh, so I did. I went to the ER and um, my Bartolin gland, which you, you have Bartolin glands um, to produce lubrication, sex and all that, had gotten um, clogs, basically a clogged duct, which happens to a surprising amount of people. But I had never heard of anybody else who had had this experience until I went through it and started talking about it. Um, so I actually had to have a couple of surgeries to, to fix the problem. Um, but if I would have looked at it, I would have been able to see that it was not, in fact, an ingrown hair and that it was, you know, a little bit um, more, in, you know, internal in, in my vaginal canal and um, would have saved a lot of money and a lot of sort of a traumatic uh, recovery time. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, if we could release our shame i think there'd be a lot of these medical expenses or emergencies that we could avoid you know if only we could look at ourselves 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I, like, I am such an advocate for that. And what I love about your mirror is that it makes it more accessible because actually looking at yourself is kind of challenging. You know, you have to have some dexterity. You have to find the right light. Like <laughs> your leg is up or you're squatting or whatever. So it's, it's not always the most accessible, like especially if you're pregnant and trying to look there. I mean, I can imagine that that takes some uh, Cirque du Soleil kind of contortions, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, for me too, uh, I think maybe especially during the pandemic, sometimes self-care um, and, and just kind of checking in on yourself doesn't happen as frequently as maybe it once did. But the fact that it sits out and kind of makes me think about it is really important. Um, and because, you know, because a lot of devices like that, um, I actually recently purchased this book called, it's called The Technology of the Orgasm, but I bought it because it has these really fantastic illustrations of like, you know, turn of the century vibrators and other obstetric devices that all look like torture devices. I bought this because I I read that the chainsaw was actually invented as a tool to help people give birth. So it wasn't a chainsaw. Like, give it, dude, totally. I'll send it. I'll send you the article. Um, but like the mechanism of the chainsaw was to cut through the perineum. Uh, oh my God to allow a baby to come out. And then they were like, this is great. And we made it bigger. And, and it is now the you know, chainsaw that we used. <laughs> but oh sorry, my gosh, yes, I have to read this book. <laughs> Your devices are terrifying. We were like, let's make something really beautiful and elegant that doesn't look like it's intended to torture you. Um, and so, you know, love having it on my vanity. Yeah. So mm-hmm. how is looking at your own vulva you know, improved your life and your self-confidence? That is a really fantastic question. Um, You know, I think we all go through distinct and individual phases in in our life. Um, I am not currently in a phase where I'm dating a lot or, or have a lot of sexual partners, but I will say I often think about that time because I think it would have been really fantastic to have that, I don't know, some sort of strange feeling, at least for me, about like this person sees me so intimately and I don't really know what I look like. Um, so I, I bring that up just to say that that I do, I think about that in terms of the mirror. Um, but right now I use it in some ways just to keep track of what's going on as I'm getting older um, and I'm getting lots of grace and, you know, perimenopause is is right around the corner. And um, it just helps me feel really rooted in my own body instead of constantly feeling reactive to things that are happening to me. Like I feel like now I have more knowledge and, some expectations which may or may not come to pass but at least again sort of a framework um for how my body is changing and i i celebrate that and i'm excited about it um and so that's i I really kind of look at it as as that and it's the same way that i would like look at my gray hairs in the mirror you know my body's changing it's different and 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 that's great and this is just a way of further understanding um how it's changed and feeling present in it instead of feeling like things are happening and um i will tell you that having a postpartum body um sometimes it's really hard to get to that place and it takes a lot of work yeah yeah self-love is is definitely a practice and when you're going through the changes it's it's good to feel like you're in a collaboration rather than things just happening to you yeah yeah Yeah. well thank you so much for joining me today Uh, please tell us where we can get all of your products and your fabulous mirror please yeah absolutely you can visit us at our our website and that's nisacare.com and i will spell it um n-y-s-s-a care c-a-r-e.com 
Um, you get the mirror, other postpartum products, um, and a lot of conversations. You can follow us at Nisa Care on Instagram. Um, and, and we always have a lot of, of sharing and collaborating to do in that space. Yeah, so you have some great articles on your site too, like really good contributors. Awesome. It was such a pleasure uh, talking with you today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Aubrey. Okay, everybody, it's time to spread your legs and spread the love. Like us, follow us, love us, subscribe, follow. Check out nisacare.com and grab that V-Vision mirror or any other products to help you through your fourth trimester and beyond. And remember that confidence comes from the bottom up. So grab a mirror, maybe a V-Vision, and look down there. See you next time.